Uh, Ms. Chamanthi, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Please, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Anupama. I hope you can hear me. Um, so um, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it's good to be back again. And uh, so let me first uh, briefly highlight uh, the SDG progress that Sri Lanka is making. Um, in terms of the Global Sustainable Development Report for 2021, Sri Lanka has improved its global rank by seven positions and is now placed at the uh, 87th place out of 165 countries. And our overall country score also um, improved slightly uh, to 68.1, which, uh, which places us above the regional average. And um, Sri Lanka is uh, making steady progress in particularly three areas, that is in SDG 4 on quality education, SDG 13 on climate action, uh, as well as SDG 1 on uh, ending poverty. And um, if you look at the, looking at the um, national policy framework that uh, we have um, set our own national development targets driven by the global level of ambition, but also taking into account the national context priorities and circumstances. Our national policy framework, uh, Vistas of Prosperity and Splendor, uh, which has been formulated after extensive consultations with a broad group of stakeholders, including the public, uh, very effectively integrates our global SDG commitments and reflects uh, considerable policy alignment. Um, we have also recently updated our NDC um, contributions um, and, uh, as a, and we have, uh, as a country, committed to achieving carbon neutrality in electricity generation by 2050 and carbon neutrality by, neutrality by 2060. Uh, various initiatives have also been taken to strengthen the institutional coordination mechanism for vertical and uh, horizontal coherence in planning, implementation, and monitoring. Now, one of the biggest challenges that we face as a country is the impact of the socioeconomic uh, impacts of COVID-19 um, and um, the limited fiscal space um, for financing for SDGs. Um, in uh, 2020, the United Nations uh, estimated this to be uh, between approximately um, uh, to, uh, two, 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 four billion US dollars per annum. And this is likely to be further widened due to the contraction of the economy uh, consequent to the pandemic. And uh, we feel that many of the gains uh, achieved in respect of the SDGs are at risk of being reversed. And uh, so therefore, uh, it is actually um, one of our priorities as a country is to ensure adequate and sustaining, uh, sustained financing for development, which is um, uh, quite a big challenge at the moment. Now, coming to that specific topic that has assigned to me, that is looking at um, strengthening democratic governance for sustainable development in Sri Lanka, I would first just like to uh, focus on the um, the principles of governance that has been uh, uh, looked at or even considered by the UN uh, Committee of Experts in Public Administration, uh, which has developed 11 principles of effective governance for sustainable development, which was also endorsed in 2018 by the Economic and Social Council. So as you know that they um, speak about uh, government effectiveness, um, accountability and inclusiveness, and uh, so um, let me just focus on uh, the liberal or democratic component of um, these uh, the principles, because I think principles have been developed to um, uh, be applicable, to, to be able to be generalizable to the different types of uh, political systems that constitute the UN uh, membership. Um, we have different types of political arrangements. But let me uh, focus very briefly on uh, how Sri Lanka is striving to ensure that its governance system conforms to these principles and then uh, to actually um, the strengthening the governance systems to be able to meet our SDG commitments. Um, looking at uh, uh, improving govern government effectiveness, um, we have, uh, in order to uh, achieve policy coherence, uh, 
there is a national steering committee on SDGs that has been established under the leadership of the prime minister, as well as various sector level task forces for collaboration, coordination, integration and dialogue across levels of government and functional areas for vertical and horizontal coherence. It yet remains a challenge because as I uh, mentioned in, my, in the previous session that we have a fairly fragmented institutional structure. But um, one of the uh, key um, initiatives to highlight is the um, establishment of a steering committee specifically focusing on SDG 16 under the leadership of the Minister of Justice in Sri Lanka to act accelerate Sri Lanka's progress on SDG 16. The committee is expected to promote integrated planning and monitoring and coordinated delivery of mandates across all agencies responsible for delivery of SDG 16 mandate, be it relating to law enforcement, corruption control, crime control, access to justice, or delivery of co public services. Our national policy framework uh, very specifically says that one of the key targets to achieve is a society that values and promotes peace. And towards this end, uh, rule of in, ensuring enforcement of law and order, corruption control, uh, ensuring uh, human security constitutes a uh, few of the main pillars of the national policy framework. And um, in order to actually further strengthen um, the national planning processes um, and also to direct uh, planning towards evidence-informed planning. The Sustainable Development Council has taken steps to address the weaknesses in the national data ecosystem and further strengthen the national statistical system uh, by building the capacity of those agencies that are responsible for primary data production uh, within the national systems in uh, Sri Lanka. And uh, the national um, SDG data portal is also an integrated reporting platform uh, and it uh, promotes transparency in government data uh, system. Um, it also provides for greater disaggregation capabilities, uh, as well as to ensure effective targeting of the most vulnerable groups uh, in planning uh, processes and also in uh, resource flows uh, to promote inclusivity in governance process. Now, um, to strengthen accountability in governance, uh, particularly focusing on integrity, Government is trying to promote anti-corruption policies and practices across the public sector. Uh, towards this end, a national anti-corruption action plan uh, has been prepared, uh, focusing on uh, prevention, investigation, and prosecution aspects. Uh, and in, it has involved all stakeholders um, in the formulation process and is currently being operationalized. There was a recent cabinet decision also to introduce legislation on campaign financing uh, through the ongoing electoral reform initiatives in order to address uh, the issues relating to political corruption. And the 2022 national budget also has proposed a modernization of the public uh, procurement process, including through the introduction of a decentralized and electronic process for enhanced efficiency and greater transparency. Uh, this uh, new process uh, is expected to be benchmarked to those followed by international financial institutions like the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. And a client-centric public service uh, has been envisaged through the ongoing digitization plans of the government for the public sector. And an increased budgetary allocation has also been made uh, in the 2022 budget. Now, looking at transparency, one of the key achievements of Sri Lanka is the enactment of the Right to Information Act in 2016 and uh, uh, the establishment of a Right to Information Commission uh, as in operationalizing the Act. The Act provides for mandatory information disclosure by public authorities. Uh, the mandatory proactive information disclosure um, uh, actually operates through um, three primary measures, that is through um, biannual and annual reporting, uh, reports submitted by public authorities to the Right to Information Commission, disclosure of information relating to initiation of development projects by um, each ministry, and also a proactive disclosure of information by all public authorities in terms of 
the regulations that have been issued under the RTI Act. Um, RTI Act provides for uh, disclosure of 16 categories of information. And this actually um, uh, also uh, promotes uh, article uh, freedom of speech and expression uh, as enshrined in the constitution of the Sri Lanka uh, by article 14 uh, of the constitution. Uh, our right to information law is ranked at fourth place in the global rankings done uh, for RTI legislation by the Center for Law and Democracy in Canada. Now, in addition to that, the uh, Information and Communication Agency uh, of Sri Lanka also maintains an open uh, government data portal, providing for greater transparency in government functions. Uh, the third aspect is the independent oversight uh, uh, that is provided you know, for administrative decisions. And towards this end, there are two uh, parliamentary committees on financial oversight that has been established and functioning fairly well. Those are the parliamentary committees on public accounts and public enterprises. And uh, there is also a considerable amount of judicial reform initiatives that are happening. Uh, the digitization of courthouses, introducing video conferencing facilities, particularly between prisoners and the judiciary uh, has been, um, and also programs to expand the judicial infrastructure, including judges and staff to expedite hearing of cases with a view to clearing the backlog of cases. I think the, uh, you know, piling up the caseload um, accumulation is one of the greatest challenges that Sri Lanka face. So several initiatives has been uh, taken to, um, to clear these backlog of cases. And, um, uh, also, a couple of law reforms, which are not really direct. Uh, I mean, uh, to look at, uh, just to briefly mention, the um, the age of marriage and the minimum age of employment uh, has also been increased, amending the Children's Act. So there's, these are notable uh, legal reforms that would ensure the protection of rights of children. Um, and then looking at some of the participatory processes that have been uh, that have been promoted in the last couple of years uh, is uh, there have been several uh, initiatives or to foster multi-stakeholder engagement in various processes, particularly in policy making, planning, and review processes. And uh, there have been increasing shifts towards uh, such uh, multi-stakeholder engagement platforms in planning, monitoring processes. Um, and also Sri Lanka is currently conducting its second voluntary national review on SDG implementation. Uh, and our institution is taking a lead in this. And in the VNR process as well, we have been conducting multi-stakeholder consultations and there is a broader engagement with the private sector, the non-government entities like the private sector, the civil society, the academia, et cetera. Now, um, another key uh, development is how the budget of 2022 was developed. This was developed through a consultative process by including the views of all groups dispersed horizontally and vertically in order to um, obtain their perspective in the budget formulation process. And then uh, there's also um, plans for community-driven development uh, through what is called the Dialogue with the Village Program. Uh, where um, the rural development programs and projects have been identified uh, by community participation through rural committees and increased uh, budgetary allocations have been made uh, to the lowest tier of government, that is the Gram Hildari divisions uh, that are closest to the people, where the, whereby the people in the villages get the authority to decide on the type of development projects to be implemented in this in the areas. So these are some of the um, more progressive reforms towards uh, strengthening uh, democratic governance in Sri Lanka for SDG achievements. Now, having said that, we also just want to highlight few um, a few actually dilemmas that we are confronted with. Uh, one is actually on the one hand uh, achieving law enforcement and security versus ensuring democratic space. I think uh, there seems to be a bit of a contradiction in, in those as well. And then also um, achieving government effectiveness uh, against uh, 
the consensual I mean, participatory process because government effectiveness is uh, about doing things, you know, um, in a timely manner, but at the same time, certain participatory processes uh, that involves consensus building, etc., seem to um, take uh, uh, quite a bit of time. So they, these are some of the challenges, the trade-offs that have to be uh, made. And then again, the SDGs framework talk a lot about coherence, but at the same time, subnational autonomy, and I see a bit of a contradiction there because um, in order to achieve uh, coherence, you know, when um, the provincial authorities also need to be given their degree of autonomy also has been cha uh, challenged. So these are um, just wanted to flag out these initiatives that are going on in Sri Lanka and the kind of dilemmas that we are currently facing. Thank you very much.